My name is Lynn Sear and I'm Assistant Director, Curatorial and Collection Development at the Queensland Art Gallery. I'm chairing our symposium today and in that role I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this inaugural event in Cinema A in the Australian Cinematheque at the New Gallery of Modern Art. Um, everything that's happening in this room today is happening for the first time. Um, so, um, and we're pretty confident that it's all going to go smoothly. Um, so, but we ask you all to cross your fingers for us. Um, thank you so much for being here on this momentous day for the gallery. I think that's the word the chairman used at the media preview this morning, but I already had it in my notes. Uh, we hope you're all as excited about what you've seen and heard so far as we are uh, to be presenting our new two-site art museum to you. I'm just going to start by making a few comments on the symposium and its topic and let you know how it's going to run in terms of the structure. Uh, this is obviously a very busy day for us, um, but we wanted to take a couple of hours, um, some time within it, to reflect on the issues that have been crucial to the development of this massive project and to ask others to uh, reflect with us and to, um, and to discuss with us. Uh, in particular, as will be obvious from the topic of the symposium, we want to talk about audiences for contemporary art, to discuss our experiences and to hear the perspectives of others. The title of the symposium, Remarking on the Ordinary, the Audience and Contemporary Art, takes as its starting point the famous definition by Raymond Williams, which is probably worth quoting in part. Culture is ordinary, that is the first fact. Every human society has its own shape, its own purposes, its own meanings. Every human society expresses these in institutions and in arts and learning. The making of a society is the finding of common meanings and directions and its growth is an active debate and amendment under the pressures of experience, contact, discovery. The questions we ask about culture are questions about deep personal meanings. Culture is ordinary in every society and in every mind. So obviously our use of this term, ordinary, isn't implying anything dull, uninteresting or prosaic. We're seeking to explore what it is that audiences, and particularly, I suppose, general audiences, connect to when they engage with contemporary art. And we've asked our speakers to respond to this proposition um, through their own professional experiences. We're going to begin with a keynote address, followed by four short presentations by other speakers who will be responding to the topic and then we hope to have time for a general discussion. Our first speaker, our keynote speaker, really doesn't need any introduction um, but I'm going to do it anyway because um, I don't know how many more times I'll get um, to introduce him as my director. Doug Hall, AM, was appointed director of the Queensland Art Gallery in 1987. Prior to this, he had been director of two regional galleries in Victoria. You've all been reading this in the paper a lot lately, I know. He has served on a range of state and federal cultural organisations, including chairman of the Visual Arts Craft Board of the Australia Council and a member of the Australia Council, and until recently, a member of the Australia International Cultural Council. He is a member of the Council of Australian Art Museum Directors, a member of the Advisory Council Austral Asia Centre of the Asia Society and Council Member of the Queensland Art Gallery Foundation. He has recently been appointed a member of the Executive Committee of the Australia Thailand Institute. Under his directorship, the Queensland Art Gallery has developed a strong engagement with Asia, especially, of course, through the Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art and the building of our collections in that area and he initiated and presented the proposal for the Queensland Gallery of Modern Art and saw it through um, along every painful step of that process. In 1999, he was awarded the University of Queensland's degree of Doctor of Philosophy for his contribution to the visual arts in Queensland. In June 2001, he was awarded a member of the Order of Australia 
and this year he was knighted by um, the Republic of France for his contributions to arts and letters, but he kept that a secret um, for some time. Okay, so Doug is going to start the real part of the proceedings for us today. Please welcome him. Uh, thanks, Lynn. As um, she's already indicated, everything's happening here for the first time because it's only possible to, for things to happen here for the first time because things were only finished yesterday. And the smell of tallow wood is very fresh. And if someone does actually press the wrong button, um, then Claire Roberts will go about two metres as the original 1930 Verlitzer from the Regent Theatre uh, arises from the floor, which is something that we're, we're commissioning, uh, that we're commissioning at the moment. Um, I know that you've all received in advance of this, well, I, I should say uh, also to congratulate my staff, if they ever know the right occasion in which to suggest that a carefully considered and reflective um, uh, dissertation on uh, contemporary art and museums should take place um, midway between a press release, a, a press conference and the official opening of the, the Gallery of Modern Art is, is, is just about as perfect pitch as you can get it. So I am going to speak to um, a number of, a number of uh, points that I've made in relation to uh, contemporary art museums and audience. And I thought a couple of days ago I had some ideas about an abstract notion of, of, of audiences, um, some favourite texts of mine that I was going to mention about um, how that engagement actually uh, takes place in interesting ways. And then I thought, really, if we're sitting in the Gallery of Modern Art, well, it's the really sensible thing to do is to talk about the way in which um, art has actually informed the architecture of this space. Our experience with audiences, interpretation, and education has informed the way we will conduct ourselves within this space and to make it somewhat more specific uh, to this building. And in doing so, I thought in, not instead of simply talking about audience, uh, the audience, I mean, it is very much about audiences. And often for public museums, it is about competing interests. Because whether we like it or not, um, government regards itself as an audience. Um, our sponsors and donors regard themselves as audiences. Our critical um, constituency in art, with art historians and academia are definitely regarded as audiences. Um, and I thought I wanted to look at some of those interconnections uh, and the way in which they have informed the way in which we interpret art the way in which we display art and the way it's informed uh, the construction of this building and some of the things that have underpinned it, not the least of which is um, not the least of which is the way in which we have integrated moving image and cinema right into the architectural fabric and programming of the building. The other thing that we're going to do in terms of pictorial imagery is there are three or four large screens as collages. Many of them will appear to be um, some kind of contradic contradictory images, um, but nevertheless I will address them. One of the things I wanted to do first off in looking at Goma is a grand pavilion-like space, and a theme that will run through the points that I wish to make, is that um, we, we, really need to, um, we really need to just take a bex and calm down on the modernist treadmill, uh, this unrelenting surge uh, of this... Um, this surge into the future um, as though we abandon history and experience behind us. Um, I want to say in relation to a lot of what we do here, it looks very fresh and it looks very new. And in many cases, it's actually just the tweaking of nuance from the last 100 and 150 years. Um, one of the texts, there are two texts that, that really um, interest me. One is Nicholas Sirota's short book um, and normal length lecture called Experience or Interpretation, The Dilemma of Museums of Modern Art. And in that lecture, he was not arguing for one or the other, and he was, but he was actually arguing for both. And so really, for me, it's a really um, influential text. Um, another one, a wonderful piece of writing that just deals with art history is Absorption and the uh, Theatricality, Painting and the Beholder in the Age of Diderot by Michael Fried. And anyone that's just simply trying to get their hand around the idea of art, audience, spectacle, uh, and the relationship of the two is the most glorious read dealing with, dealing with the French Enlightenment in the late 18th century. So it's a fabulous book. He's also, of course, known as a, as a very serious uh, writer and critic on modern American painting, um, 
British for that matter as well. But that is a, a fab fabulous piece of writing. In response to, um, in response to Nick uh, Sirota's uh, book, uh, David Carrier in, in the Art Journal in the, in the 90s said it is misleading to speak of experience or interpretation, um, for it is the experience of, for, is it, uh, it is it the experience of art possible with, uh, without the interpretation of what we see? And of course the answer is, uh, is somewhat self-explanatory. What I want to talk about in relation to Goma though is the, the idea that art has actually shaped architecture. While there is a natural civic uh, sense of pride that takes place on behalf of the government in relation to what this building represents for Brisbane on the last reach of the river here that overlooks the city and the, uh, and the city overlooks it, um, it is not simply a grand piece of architecture for the sake of it. Um, it is actually an architecture which is formed out of the experience of modern contemporary art of the last 30 years. And the relationship that the audience will have with the art in this space uh, should see a close reciprocity between the, between the two. Um, it is a pavilion space. Um, that The cruciform that actually um, connects east, west, north and south gives a relationship of the viewer to the site itself, um, but there are very few opportunities where you escape or miss the opportunity to look at, to look at art. Um, it is a pavilion, as I said, and I don't think there's anything more democratic than a pavilion. Um, when you look at it um, either closely as you walk from the gallery itself, or you take the long view, um, it cannot be confused as a commercial building. It's self-evidently not a residential building. It looks like a public building. Um, it's a building that seems to defy, I guess, through the use of materials and the scale, um, its own, the materials of, of weight. It floats and it is very light. It's a building in which the audience feels as though space is moving away from them, um, yet it doesn't have an, a, grandeur, a sense of grandeur about it which is unnecessarily imposing or arrogant. In other words, we think we have provided uh, an accessible, egalitarian, democratic space in which audiences can see art um, in an environment um, which is, we think, not possible in any other place in Australia. If you think of contemporary Australian art, international art for that matter, after 1970, um, Goma is the place in which people in Brisbane will be able to see the art of their generation in a comprehensive way, um, unmatched by anywhere else. We think that's important as a civic gesture and, make, and also um, makes a museological point about the differences between uh, the fabulous histories of the other state galleries um, throughout Australia, of which the Queensland Art Gallery could ne never have uh, possibly hoped to imagine. The, um, the idea of a pavilion, as I said, is, is not new. If you think of the Crystal Palace exhibition of 1851, the exhibition, um, the exhibition building in, in Melbourne of 1888, and all the great international and intercolonial exhibitions, not only were they grand um, civic and cultural moments, um, but they also said something about the value of cultural diplomacy, about who we are, how we wish others to see it, and how we represent culture. So in that context, GOMA, I guess at this moment, in terms of the government's mind's eye, represents uh, many, of those, many of those moments of, uh, of history. And the kind of people we attract doesn't appear to have changed very much when it comes to uh, uh, those particular uh, great, uh, great moments. The other thing and the other disturbing thing about audiences and access to their own culture is that the volume of works that we have been acquiring for the last 20 or 30 years, um, and there have been many, um, and we've, I think art museums in Australia no longer discreetly acquire. They have they have in the last decade or so begun to ingest, and, and, and in the case of, of some art forms, forcibly fed. Um, this has really significant consequences for art education. It has consequences for access. It has consequences, I think, for artists' reputations as well. That the volume of works that we acquire, if we do so with discrimination and the belief of their value to modern and contemporary Australian life, and the astonishingly good works that have been acquired and entered collections, um, you look at them by number, you look at the inevitable static nature of buildings themselves. Um, there are significant works of art in Australian public collections which will never be seen in the artist's lifetime. And that is a crazy situation. And we wanted to create um, a building which enabled us to program the art of our own generation in a way 
um, which was relevant, um, which was discursive and which was expansive. Um, that also brings up, of course, the other dilemma of how and why we collect in particular, in particular areas. I think it's, from, from, from my point of view, um, I'm still somewhat old fashioned in this regard. I believe in the, the, uh, the really critical judgments that need to be made to make distinguished curator, curatorship and outstanding collections. I actually believe that the, the, the idea of contextualization um, can become and perhaps always will be an endless and incomplete exercise that is um, self-perpetuating in its capacity for incompleteness. Um, and the point about that is made more clearly when you look at the historical notion of encyclopedic collections um, and the ne necessity for either or a more considered, or more considered a view that we might need to take of encyclopedic and contextualization. And I think it was Thomas Krenz who posed the question, in an age of mobility, why be encyclopedic? Um, it also um, adds the supplementary question, I guess, is it ever possible to be completely uh, uh, encyclopedic um, and are chronologies um, um, uh, able to be uh, achieved uh, within the context of what we might understand by that? Um, the, answer is, the answer is probably no. But uh, as I said, in, in an age of mobility, um, contextualization and encyclopedic are really significant issues which I think need to be uh, debated by art museums. I think another a good example of um, another good example of the repetition of the canon in relation to the way in which art museums have shared their views throughout much of the 20th century um, and simply since and sim certainly since um, critical counts of modernism after the Second World War have given expression to it. Um, I hasten to add, well, while I may appear critical here, um, it's about art which I actually like. Um, but I'm not sure that the museological canon is the most is, is the most um, is the one that we would all wish to follow. It, it brings up, and I won't labour the point of Me Too curatorship, uh, the extent to which stories are repeatedly told um, in the, you know, for example, up and down the east coast of Australia, with only subtle subtle changes often taking place. Um, and I'm reminded recently, being in America, that the American Art Museum experience is is um, a good example of the unrelenting need to present a complete and supposedly agreed canon of American art, particularly after the, uh, the Second World War, um, as though sameness and, and comparable achievement is some kind of unquestioned pinnacle. Now, I'm not the one to question uh, that pinnacle because I happen to like it, but it is possible to travel to, for three weeks, and a dozen museums in America and enter galleries marked American art post-World War II and find the same thing everywhere. Now, I know Tom Sokolovsky's here. He might be able to tell me uh, um, the detours that do exist uh, from, the, um, from, the, um, from the major highways, but it's, um, it's, it's the fracturing of the canon that I find particularly exciting, and it's all the detours, which I think we found interesting when we rethought this institution in relation to the cultural engagements that it might, uh, that it might wish to have. What came out of that, um, generally in Australia, I think in the last 20 or 30 years, has obviously been the experience with Indigenous culture, which I don't need to talk about here, other than to say that it's probably the longest continuing art movement in the history of Australian art. Uh, secondly, it's the thing that in, internationally most people seem to feel most at ease with, um, probably because it is the, uh, the least derivative, um, and it's one which has obviously had a critical effect on the Australian art market. Putting those factors, though, to one side and looking at an institution that decides to embrace other cultures and cultural experience and to look at what that represents in terms of the audience and the public responsibility. And I think the APT and the Asian collections, the focus of this gallery towards uh, the 20th century and the latter part of it, has created a city which has, been, um, extra has become extraordinarily culturally uh, literate about contemporary art. And while the Courier Mail is not the personification of measurement for public opinion, um, it's fair to say, though, that throughout the course of that agenda that we've had and through the development of the Gallery of Modern Art, I can only recall in 16 years two letters to the editor uh, and one story that were anti it. Uh, the two letters to the editor I've forgotten about, um, and the story was when the head of the Queensland Police Union arrived on site 
to point out how many police stations in regional Queensland could be got for the price of a gallery of modern art. And he was probably right, and he's doing his job, and I don't disagree with him, and the government's view was it was, of course, never one or the other but both, and it's how they manage public infrastructure. We wanted to do the same with uh, audiences, um, sorry, in relation to audiences and, and uh, visual literacy, um, with the cinema and moving, uh, and moving image. Um, someone said recently, one of our sponsors, in fact, who uh, owns a large uh, cinema chain, he said, you know, the, the, what makes, and, and a keen collector of contemporary art and, and so supportive of the Australian Cinematheque. And he said, you know, um, they have, it's really interesting that this is happening um, and it's really important, he said, explaining that he doesn't go and see the films that he screens, that there have never been so many movie screens in Australia and there have never been so few choices. Um, and that was encapsulated a, a very uh, simple... Um, for me, it encapsulated the very uh, simple moment in which it showed the role that the cinema might serve in creating a, cin a cinema literate city or a more cinema literate city in relation to the capacity of what both cinemas and the new media gallery might be able to uh, might be able to achieve. Coming back though um, to the idea of competing interests with our audiences and the way in which we deal with those, or we coexist with them, uh, and the way in which there's a, a support for each other, or at least an understanding uh, for each other in what we do. So I talked earlier about, of course, we have the object itself. We have art history and academia. There are those involved in theory, bureaucracy, government collectors, donors, and sponsors. Then there are sections which have a, a fear and loathing of popularism. Um, that doesn't include two thirds of the people that I've just mentioned. Um, generally less so now, but that was pretty bad in the, in the 1980s. And a week or two ago, I was reading in the New York um, uh, book review um, some, th some things on the Getty. And if we think about the notion of popularism, if we think about um, objects which are regarded as high, high art, if we think about the context of which they're shown and the public that come to see them, then there are some interesting, interesting points here that I think are... Um, are relevant to, to, to think about. Uh, Martin Filler wrote in the context of the Getty, um, but elevate, this is the new, this is the new Getty, but elevating um, the villa uh, vastly improved the museum's west-facing sea views. If suspension of disbelief is need to convince oneself that beyond lies the Mediterranean rather than the Pacific, it's the easiest and most satisfying stretch of the imagination one is asked to make in this strange, seductive and undeniably entrancing environment the guiltiest pleasure in the, in the modern museum world. It's a faithful reproduction of nothing that ever existed. And I think that's the kind of uh, experience that many museums face at the moment, which is the notion of taking works of art which happen in the studio of artists through the most intense moments of personal and creative introspection, putting them into public spaces, putting them next to other objects in which we try to create meanings, but for which none were ever originally intended. And that is, a, that's a, that's a, I think, a really critical point in highlighting um, what curate, the, the crisis of what curatorship often has to deal with. And of course, when you're dealing with uh, contemporary art, as, as Goma will do and the staff here do, um, and we are making assessments now, we do not have the benefit of hindsight and considered reflection uh, to be able to retweak and readjust. And I think sharing those experiences with our public um, and receiving kind of informed and critical response from those that are involved in the same field is one of the most rewarding parts of uh, contemporary, um, contemporary curatorship. But it also um, brings up the point, I guess, of um, the fact that politicians, funding agencies, except enlightened figures like the Australia Council, uh, do like um, to measure things substantially by bums on seats, you know, numbers through the door, and we know that, we know that phenomenon fairly well. Um, and there is another point that is made in relation to the Getty Villa, and I quote again, large numbers of people who do not ordinarily visit museums like the Getty, uh, like the Getty a great deal, just as its founder knew they would. There is one of those peculiar social secrets at work here. On the whole, the critics, quote unquote, um, subscribe to the romantic view of man's possibilities, but the public, quote unquote, uh, does not. In that way, the Getty stands above the Pacific Coast Highway, 
is one of those odd monuments, a palpable contract between the very rich and the people who distrust them least. And I thought that was a fabulous quote for any museum director that deals with the public um, and then deals with, um, deals with the expectations of, um, of sponsors and others. But it also brings into play, and I guess, the, in terms of audience and interpretation, uh, the Getty phenomenon, which is provenance and context count for so much. Um, as soon as um, Alan Bond uh, went to jail or they paid $57.3 million for irises, um, a particularly impressive but not overly important Van Gogh, the public headed towards it as they walked past other significant works of art to experience something which was happening in their own mind's eye that I can't particularly uh, explain at this moment. The problem for art museums is also that when we're looking at critical reaction and responses to what we do, um, there is often um, the singular view that seeks to speak for everyone, and I think everyone working in an art museum knows that that is just simply not possible. That we don't have an audience and that there is no fixed um, story and context or manner of approach in terms of display and interpretation that holds true. Modernism would probably, I guess, those that argue for the um, those that argue for the reductive and minimalist display would argue that um, the neutral hang, as it were, some, is, is some kind of inert space. But in fact, it's you know the minimalist hang, uh, the white cube and what have you, I would argue is in fact a very declarative space in, in, what, it, in what it represents. And in fact, is just another uh, manifestation of the notion of art as spectacle. Um, and I don't deny that museums and designers have used um, art as a... Um, have used spaces within art museums to pr present art in ways which have engaged them in, in, uh, in supposedly non-traditional ways. Although you would see that spaces earlier on were uh, highly animated in salon and, and, and academy spaces with multiple hangings and there were particular reasons uh, behind that. To be hung on the line was a critical judgment about the status of the work and the particular artist to be anywhere else was, a, a dimini was an assessment of um, a, a work of diminished quality or lesser quality. So the idea of art as a spectacle um, um, is not new and the idea of the animated object um, is, is um, or the object being animated in different ways is not particularly new either. If we think, for example, we can look on the right hand side there of the number five show, um, Street and Roberts, uh, Condra McCubbin's exhibition in Melbourne in the Buxton Street Gallery, uh, Buxton Galleries in Swanson Street in 1889. Um, that, was, that was a highly animated space born out of the aesthetic movement of London with an interest in Japan and what have you. The, the artists wanted to, to use that space as a, and animate that space to amplify uh, the point that they had through the small nine, nine by five um, pictures. It was art as spectacle, and it was art that was animated and was done so um, uh, for very specific reasons and was conceived by the artists themselves. In fact, you could say in terms of a conceptual exhibition in Australia uh, by Australian artists, it was the, probably the first one that, uh, that ever, ever took place. Um, those that seek, I guess, the neutral hang and invoke modernism, I would also argue, have, have, have got it... Um, have got it wrong as well. I mean, if we actually think about um, spaces which animate the object for particular purposes, you can think of the Rothko Room at the Tate. Uh, there's the Stations of the Cross at the um, in the IMP building, uh, the East Wing of the uh, National Gallery of Art in Washington. Um, you can walk on a Carl Andre. Uh, Fluxus is very um, is very performative and. Um, and integrated with its audience. And Joseph Kasuth uh, produces work which is uh, where the object itself actually becomes the explanation. We should also think, you said there was a clock here. Tell me when to stop. Um, okay. The, um, the, again, invoking, invoking um, modernism's agenda, people are, should also remember that Alfred Barr, after 30 years as director of MoMA, um, grouped uh, objects to flesh out art historical and cultural relationships. Um, many today, and his diagram uh, does, look somewhat, uh, does look somewhat daggy, um, his view of 20th century art and some of its sources, um, but, um, and was sometimes the subject of uh, ridicule, if not contempt. 
Uh, but he was also the one that first, that first introduced uh, the expanded label itself to recognise that uh, if art museums are about the acquisition of knowledge, um, they have a public and moral obligation to share that. Um, and that's very much, as I see, the role of public galleries. I briefly just now touch on the phenomenon of temporary exhibitions, of course, they're the things of the last 30 years in Australia which have really shaped so much of uh, audience development. Um, whether I think it's a good or bad thing is largely irrelevant now because it's happened. Um, the collections are no longer he uh, heroes, but the collections are absolutely critical to what we do and will remain so. And inevitably, I guess there will be some cyclical shift which will enable us and to um, have, a, have a different relationship with our collections and our, and our public. Suffice to say that the nature of programming itself um, has shaped the nature of our relationship with our audiences, and I'll come to talk about art, artists, art history and scholarship in a minute, but also um, art museums themselves. And for those of you that have been in, in the gallery, the Queensland Art Gallery itself, Gallery 4, which is where the Pacific collections are at the moment behind the water mall, is a large temporary exhibitions gallery space. Part of the brief of the architect on that, on, for, for that gallery was to recognise all those years ago, when it opened in 1982, that temporary exhibitions were a phenomenon and were not going to go away, and that the architecture of that building had to reflect what was to be new museological practice. This building itself takes that into account as well that programming will, will, for the time being, obviously drive what this uh, institution uh, is about. So the temporary exhibitions uh, and our audiences um, is a particular and unique relationship and it's, uh, and it's here to stay. I guess I'd like to close by saying that the role of art history in Australia is absolutely critical and while decades ago it may have been argued that academia uh, was the fountainhead which provided the most critical discourse for art history, I would think in the last 10 or 20 years that's probably not the case. With the kind of crazy corporatisation of universities, the intensity of programming in public galleries, um, the relationships that have now been formed between public galleries and academia, and academia itself, um, and the public uh, publications that support those exhibitions, I think you would have to agree that in the public mind's eye that it is public galleries in Australia that shape art history. Um, and that is a very significant uh, responsibility that goes with it. I've made a note here just to look at um, some of the exhibitions that have happened recently just to amplify the point. I know Sebastian Smee with the exhibition Goddess at the Art Gallery in New South Wales described it as the most intelligent exhibition of the year um, and I would agree with him. Um, other exhibitions that have happened there include Buddha, um, the gallery here is not anti-blockbuster at all, and we formed a, a relationship with the Bibliothèque Nationale all those years ago to do Toulouse-Lautrec, and later on with Art Exhibitions Australia to do uh, exhibitions with Renoir and, uh, and Matisse. The Australian National Gallery in Canberra is, has now produced a catalogue resume of Preston's prints, um, and the list could go on. It's not to say that we miss out ever on moments of opportunism. We've, we've shown... Princess Di's wedding dress in the Queensland Art Gallery, pre my time as you could imagine. I, I want to show her Mercedes actually in the Gallery of Modern Art. It's probably not going to, uh, probably not going to happen. So um, I think the, the responsibilities that we have with our audiences are no longer simply uh, an engagement of cultural leisure but in fact an engagement of real serious scholarship that goes with the exhibitions and the programming that, uh, that we develop. Um, so, I just wanted to, as I said, take the opportunity to, uh, to touch on those issues that uh, affect us as, as a museum that go beyond the person that simply walks in the door um, and to recognise that nothing is mutually exclusive from anything else and managing it, managing it can, be, uh, can be quite fun. Thank you. Thanks to Doug uh, for being his usual conservative self. Um, we'll move straight into our responses. And our first respondent is uh, a new friend for the gallery, um, someone that we first met last year on our first uh, curatorial trip associated with the Asia Pacific Triennial to Hawaii. I don't know why we hadn't thought of going there before because it's certainly a very nice place um, to do curatorial research. 
We met Vilsoni there and he's um, since um, made a couple of contributions to the work that we do here, as he is about to again today. Uh, Professor Vilsoni Heroniko is the editor of the Contemporary Pacific, the Centre for Pacific Island Studies at the University of Hawaii. He is an award-winning playwright, filmmaker, author and teacher. He was born on the island of Rotuma, has a master's degree in education from the University of Newcastle upon Tyne in England and a PhD in literature and language from the University of the South Pacific in Fiji. In 1991, he joined the Centre for Pacific Island Studies, where he teaches courses in Pacific literature, film and theatre. He has written a dozen plays, several books, numerous articles, edited many anthologies, as well as written and directed a documentary, a short film and an acclaimed debut feature film, The Land Has Eyes. His plays and films have been performed or exhibited in Korea, Singapore, Vietnam, Germany, Canada, Australia, the Netherlands, France and Great Britain. His feature film, The Land Has Eyes, had its world premiere at the Sundance Film Festival in 2004 and was also invited to screen at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, as well as the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. Vilsoni has written a superb uh, text for us in our um, APT catalogue on Pacific performance. So please welcome him to the podium. Also. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to congratulate the uh, organizers of this incredible um, Asia Pacific uh, Triennial. Uh, I didn't realize before coming here what a big significant event uh, this is going to be. And uh, from everything I've seen so far, I'm very impressed. And uh, I don't see what I could possibly teach you that you haven't been doing already and doing very successfully. In fact, uh, it seems that you are leading the way and we should be learning from you. Now, having said that, I'm sure uh, that I have been asked to uh, share a few thoughts because I'm from the Pacific with considerable experience uh, in the art world. And so, given the limited time I have, what I would like to do is to uh, throw out some ideas uh, in response uh, to the issues that uh, uh, Doug has uh, laid out and also uh, some of the questions that Lynn has also um, uh, mentioned at the beginning of introduction. Um, <clears throat> the question of audience is a fascinating one for me and when I think about it and its relationship with art, uh, I think back to when I was growing up and what it, it was like um, going to witness traditional dance on the island of Rotuma. And those of you who have been to Polynesia um, or some parts of Melanesia, you'll be aware that this quite often happens. Um, a number of uh, uh, performers, probably about 40 to 50 or so in a mass traditional dance, are performing. And the performers, uh, and as they perform, they become so worked up, they're very excited. Uh, sometimes the dancers break out of frame. There may be some clowning. There may be some individuals doing their own thing. And then when it works exceptionally well, the audience members get up from their seats and make their way towards the dancers, towards the performers, and break that space between the art and the audience. And quite often, it's interactive. Sometimes they take off what they are wearing and, and throw them around, you know, the dancers. Um, they have been known to put things in people's mouths, uh, you know, spray uh, perfume, talcum powder, whatever, right? But to me, this merging of audience and art is incredible. And that's when you know that the performance or the art is working and it is at its best, and it is the audience that gives the art its validation, its um, 
credibility. Because if it's not working, they will be there in the audience. They will not get up. They will not interact. Those of us who have been to uh, kabuki performances also experience this, this calling you know, to the performers, right? And so this relationship is fascinating to me. And sometimes I wonder how uh, modern museums and galleries can perhaps learn from that. And today, I was very pleased to see um, an Aboriginal uh, um, dance group kind of singing in to the, uh, uh, their, um, their contribution to the um, exhibition. This happened uh, just before lunch today. And uh, I know not too many people saw that, but I thought that was a wonderful example of how uh, you can bring in the different art forms so that they interact and they work together. And in fact, it enhances the art uh, objects because they have been sung to, because they, the right protocol has been followed. And I, I would definitely encourage that sort of thing uh, with, with museums because I think that enhances the mana, at least for people from the Pacific, of the um, objects that are being displayed. Uh, the quote that culture is ordinary makes sense to me, but I couldn't help but wonder if we as audience members expect the art to be extraordinary. Because if it is ordinary, then we have no particular need to go to an art gallery or to an art museum. So there is that expectation of something extraordinary. And uh, that gets me thinking about this. And then I think back to um, the contemporary dance theater at the Oceania Center for Arts and Culture in Fiji, um, in which a multicultural group of young people uh, choreograph and perform um, contemporary dances. And these are dances that draw heavily from traditional uh, perform, uh, performance, but they take us to another level. They, they're movements that uh, remind us of perhaps traditional uh, elements or movements that we have seen before, but they're also very different, sometimes very stylized. And uh, as I watch audiences, and as I reflect and think about my reaction to what I'm seeing, because in some ways they are uh, breaking new ground in terms of what they're doing, I say to myself, now what am I connecting to and why am I so uh, attracted to the kind of work they're doing? And I realized that um, freedom, the freedom that they display in their performance is something that I'm attracted to. And I suspect that you, when you watch uh, a work of art that is very daring, very courageous, very bold, you say to yourself, I could never do that. Or maybe you say to yourself, I wish I could do that if only I haven't been so constrained or so missionized or so religious or whatever it might be that is holding us back. So the freedom that the art or the artist is able to um, encapsulate or embody in the art form is for me and maybe for you something that draws you to that work. Also the exuberance of the dances of the Polynesian, of the Oceania Center for Arts and Culture really excites me. I feel a vitality, a dynamism uh, that I don't quite often see in some uh, performances. Um, and I wonder if when you go to see some of the artwork that is being displayed over here, uh, Masami's work, for example, uh, you know, the, those incredible colors, the combination uh, of various elements seem to um, excite me, right? Um, and the senses, so the freedom and the exuberance is for me what I'm connecting to in the art. And I wonder whether that is also the case with you. Uh, I would also like to congratulate the Pacific Islanders whose work um, have been chosen to be uh, displayed in this, in this exhibition. I must say that uh, when I look at uh, the selection, what you have is the creme de la creme of the Pacific. Those are not ordinary works of art. They are our best. And I, I certainly thank your curators. You have done an incredible job. Because if I were in your shoes, I would have chosen the same artists, the same work. And I don't know how you managed to do that, but you've certainly succeeded. Um, 
the work of John Poole, right? As you come in, you see uh, to the left the cover of the catalog. Um, he's an incredible artist, and I cannot say that his art is very accessible to the masses of Pacific Islanders. And I cannot say that all of us Pacific Islanders, when we see his art, we say we understand everything that is there. But there is a freedom. There is an exuberance that connects us to that work. And we don't need to understand everything, right? But we know that what we are watching is something extraordinary. Uh, the work of Sima Urale, the filmmaker, if you get the chance, I would definitely encourage you to see her work. She's featured um, here, and I'm very pleased that you have her work here. Um, she's creating for us a film language that um, we have never before, uh, we have never seen on screen before. If you watch um, Otamaiti, the children, for example, the way in which she sees the world through the children's eyes, reminding us of the work uh, of Ozu from Japan. Not necessarily the, that she's been influenced by that, but, but the way she cuts off the heads right, of the minister, for example. I mean, how could anyone do that when you come from a very religious place um, from the Pacific? But she's not afraid to do that. There's a freedom in that. There's, there's, there's courage in that kind of film language that she's creating uh, for us. Uh, if you get the chance, um, hear Sia Figuel, uh, to Siata as well, two performance poets whose work uh, is greatly loved and admired by the rest of the Pacific. Why? The same qualities, this freedom that they have. They are not afraid uh, to critique the power structure. Uh, the power structure. They are not afraid to challenge the status quo or to use language that uh, uh, we only whisper about in secret. Right? And I think the same things uh, that draw me to the other works of art are the same that I find in their work as well. The question of scholarship and dumbing down is also an interesting one for me. And as someone who teaches specific literature and has to make choices as to what to teach and what to leave out, as an editor of an academic journal who receives papers from scholars who sometimes think that the, the way uh, um, to write academic work is to use jargon, uh, words that ordinary people don't understand. And quite often in academia, it's very strange. But the more obscure you are, the more venerated you are. The more people think you're brilliant because they don't quite know what you are saying. And quite often as the editor, because it's interdisciplinary, I have to write back to tell them to use words that ordinary people can understand. Not to dumb down, but to communicate clearly, to make their work accessible. Because I believe that it is the audience, it is the readers, right? who validate your work, who give your work credibility. And if you do not connect to them, then you are speaking to yourself. And even though the art, at the end of the day, has to be extraordinary, otherwise it's not art, it has to connect at an ordinary level. Thank you. Thank you, Vilsoni. Our next speaker is Roger McDonald, who has flown overnight from Tokyo um, to be here with us today, arriving um, not too long ago. Um, and we're very grateful for the special effort that he's made to be here. Roger was born in Tokyo uh, in 1971, was educated in the UK, studying international politics, mysticism and religious experience and the history and theory of art. He's a founding member of the Arts Initiative Tokyo, a non-profit curatorial collective in 2002 and a curator for the Singapore Biennale in 2006, the inaugural Singapore Biennale. So please welcome Roger.
hello. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm sort of starting to get a bit hazy, but things are fine in, in order. Um, I'm going to read from a prepared paper, so um, do forgive me. Um, it's really wonderful to be here in Brisbane to see the Asia-Pacific uh, Triennale, an exhibition I have, of course, been very familiar with for many years, but never had the opportunity to visit. Furthermore, it is wonderful to be here as a respondent in the opening symposium, but more importantly, as a member of the audience and not an organizer. And I say this having just completed an 18-month involvement as a member of the curatorial team for the first Singapore Biennale, which closed November 12, under the directorship of Fumio Nanjo. And being involved in such large-scale international exhibitions on all levels is certainly uh, both an immense privilege, but also something which manages to seep into almost every aspect of one's life and thus affects everything else. When I was back in Singapore for the closing, staff in the office had affectionately replaced the letter B of the title belief with the letter R, a sentiment I think all of the curators also shared. So I fully appreciate the efforts of all of the staff and artists here in Brisbane who have realized the fifth APT. Uh, I began to ponder what to say here today while still in Singapore during the days after the Biennale had closed. It felt slightly sad as all of the works prepared over 18 months were deinstalled and created or destroyed. The Biennale office seemed somehow drained and lean and staff prepared to depart for other positions and jobs. It dawned on me that this is the reality of exhibitions, enormous undertakings which require huge financial, physical and labor needs and which necessarily come to an end. The Singapore Biennale in particular, I think, exuded this sense of melancholy with over 19 venues, including living religious sites and decommissioned buildings, all closing down after two and a half months. Many of the sites were public spaces, including a Hindu and Buddhist temple, Catholic churches, a mosque, and a synagogue, as well as one public housing complex. In these sites, where people from different communities prayed or lived, I felt that certain relationships had begun to form between them and the various artworks and projects placed there. In the Kwam Hood Temple, Buddhist temple, the Taiwanese artist Tsai Chao Wei had written sutras onto the leaves and stalks of a lotus plant with black ink, which had been placed in the entrance of the temple. After several days, some worshippers began to offer prayers and bow in front of this plant, a totally unexpected and wonderful response to this work in this particular place. Similarly, at the public housing apartments, the Danish art collective Learning Site initiated a mushroom growing farm inside the kindergarten, which was adopted by the children and local community living there as a farming experiment and source of fresh food. Mushroom soup was made weekly and the harvested mushrooms distributed for free around the apartments. The end of the Biennale also meant the end of these kinds of relationships, and perhaps this was what I was feeling. As it happens, we have managed to negotiate for the mushroom farm at least to be continued by the local polytechnic as a learning platform. And so I began to think about the nature of exhibitions as learning sites, as vehicles for audiences to, in a sense, empower themselves. And I pondered the question posed by the symposium. What do audiences find in contemporary art to make them want to return for more? Perhaps I can briefly share my thoughts on these matters with you now, more as discussion points rather than well-tuned arguments. Uh, the first aspect I'd like to think about concerns the nature of the experience of audiences to large-scale contemporary art exhibitions. What kinds of experiences are they? And how much control do artists and curators actually have in forming them? One can, I think, discuss this in terms of the narratives or stories written by curators and artists to either lead visitors through an exhibition or provide some overall conceptual structure which frames one's experience. For Singapore, for example, we decided to title the exhibition Belief, a word which we felt could resonate broadly and provide a frame for, visit for visitors to at least start to engage with the artworks. I think exhibitions invariably employ such framing devices in the form of titles, captions, and catalog texts, and that these are the official markers by which one can start to understand the show. But then there is the whole aspect of what remains unscripted or which slips out of the overall framework set by the organizers. I like to think that in these aspects, which generate some of the more interesting 
uh, and lasting effects of any, any exhibition. What happens after someone reads a wall caption? Or what, what are the connections being made while someone is walking between two artworks? What stays in someone's mind after the exhibition experience? And how does it, in fact, sort of infect their everyday experiences? And one way to understand this may be by referring to the writings of Michel de Certo, who spoke about strategies and tactics. Uh, de Certo defines two kinds of behavior, the strategic and the tactical. He takes the terms out of their military context and injects them with new meaning. He describes institutions in general as strategic and everyday people who are non-producers as tactical. A strategy is an entity that is recognized as some kind of authority. It may be anything from an institution or a commercial outfit to an individual whose behavior coincides with the author's proposed definition of strategic. In this category, we may include museums and the organizers of biennials. A strategy may enjoy status as some kind of dominant order or be sanctioned by the powers that be. It usually manifests itself physically in its sites of operations, sort of offices, headquarters, and in its products, laws, languages, rituals, commercial goods, inventions, discourses. It has use of dedicated resources and, exp and is expected to incur considerable overheads. Now, in contrast, De Certo's tactical model describes individuals or groups which are fragmented in terms of space and maintain no specific site of operation, no headquarters, but who are instead capable of swiftly combining according to a current necessity. With no ownership of dedicated resources, a tactic manages to be lean compared to a strategy. It is essentially makeshift in nature and cannot rely on a proper economy. Instead, it might depend on a gift economy, on time. In other words, it waits for resources it does not own or did not make to go idle. And on loopholes, it will infiltrate but will not try to take over. I think that we can identify the tactical with audiences and the ways in which they create their own routes through the strategic plans of curators and museums. De Certo refers to pedestrians walking through the city in this way, pointing out that they take shortcuts, cut across streets randomly, and generally misuse the proper channels of walking provided by city authorities. So I think that exhibitions on the scale of biennales and triennales in particular may be read in this way, as laying out strategic maps for audiences, which are very often used or perhaps more importantly, misused tactically. I think we all experience exhibitions in this way, combining the strategic information provided by the organizers with our own tactical instincts and interests. And often some of the most interesting learning or understanding comes from this unscripted zone. A second area I would like to ponder is thinking about when audiences learn about artworks. This relates to the activities of Arts Initiative Tokyo, AIT, a curatorial collective of which I'm a founding member. We began in 2001, after the first Yokohama Triennale of 2001, by initiating an independent contemporary art school, in short, evening classes, which offered various courses, including the first curatorial training program in Japan, a critical reading course, an audience course, and an artist's course. Operating free of the bureaucratic strictures of academic frameworks, our school attracts around 130 people each year, taking all of the various courses, some one year long, others short three-month courses. The majority of our students are working people from banking, advertising, or housewives, and the age range is usually wide, with an average age somewhere in the early 30s. One of our motivations for beginning this was our involvement on various levels in the Yokohama Triennale and realizing that there was a large, eager audience for contemporary art in Tokyo. The Triennale, in many ways, energized this constituency through volunteer programs and guidance schemes. But once the exhibition ended, we felt that this integral audience wanted to continue interacting with contemporary art in some way, and that existing arts institutions, including the museums and art schools, were not providing this sense of community. MAD, as our school is called, was there something which we felt was lacking in Tokyo at that point in time, and which we felt strongly uh, was needed. We had the knowledge and skills to provide this service and initiated it. So I return to my point 
I would be interested to ask whether the development and educating of contemporary art audiences occurs only during the period of an exhibition in the forms of the various outreach and public programs, or also in between exhibitions as a kind of low temperature simmering of learning. My thinking recently is that exhibitions are actually testing grounds, laboratories of doubt and questioning, where audiences can test the learning they acquire in between exhibitions. Our approach at AIT has been somewhat in this direction, trying to provide a constant ambient level of learning through taught courses, talks or outings, which may then be tested in the exhibition experience. The ways in which learning is structured and framed in our cultures largely excludes this sense of ongoing learning, privileging education as a formal, intense experience prior to entering the labor pool. By initiating MAD, we realized that many working people with deep interests in art and culture want to continue learning and thus meet other like-minded people. The whole genre of evening classes, often derided by formal educational establishments, provides in this sense one of the most important and progressive channels for further learning. I'm increasingly also now of the opinion that the exhibition should not be privileged as the primary experience of art, but that it is rather one point on a broader spectrum of learning spaces. My curatorial interests are increasingly towards working on projects with artists or spaces that take this aspect seriously. One new initiative AIT have just recently begun is something called Mad Artists. We organize Tokyo's first systematic artist in residence program, partnering with various arts organizations from around the world and hosting artists and curators in Tokyo. Um, we have also hosted two Australian curators, supported by Asia Link. We do not put emphasis on the artist working towards an exhibition or display of work, but rather on forms of research. Magnus was intrigued by a North Korean film called Pulgasari, directed by a kidnapped South Korean director in 1984 and made as a Korean propaganda version of Godzilla. Over three classes, Magnus screened the film, contextualized his interests in this area, and led discussions about the film and the relationships between artistic practice and authority. And we intend to continue this and now include this invitation to lead a course in all our residency literature. Finally, in closing, it would be useful to return to the initial proposition that I received from APT, which was that people return to contemporary art because they, they are connecting to the ordinary. I think this is certainly true on many levels, in particular at the level of institutional presentations of art, where perhaps a conscious outreach programming is usually initiated. However, it struck me as I prepared this presentation that much of what we do at uh, AIT through our MAD courses actually proposes a, a different answer to this. What we have discovered is that many people sign up for our courses because it provides something more extraordinary and different from their ev everyday experiences. Uh, MAD offers a more engaged and sustained encounter with art and its ideas and is thus quite different to most public programs offered at museums. The kinds of things we can explore are thus, are thus also quite unique and often more challenging. What is more, it is not bound to the exhibition or specific works of art. The Critical Readers course, for example, provides a six-session meeting of interested people from many walks of life to read and discuss critical texts related to contemporary art. This is something which simply does not exist outside the academic system, which most of us have left. From talking with participants, I'm of the impression that many take our courses because it offers something different to what museums offer. I think I could go so far as to say that we provide a more committed arena for learning about contemporary art and its often difficult aspects. The fact that MAD is structured as evening classes as a series of fortnightly courses and organized by a nonprofit collective, perhaps all contribute to its uniqueness and difference to what larger museums can offer. So although I do share the view that much contemporary art certainly extends out of and into our ordinary experiences, I would also say that the reasons for people to come back to it are more layered and reflect the knowledge bases and backgrounds of the audience we speak of. Thanks for listening so patiently. Thank you, Roger. Everything's working so far. Our next speaker, Claire Roberts, an old friend of the gallery. Claire is Senior Curator, Asian Decorative Arts and Design at the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney 
and a research fellow in the Division of Pacific and Asian History at the Australian National University. She studied Chinese language painting and art history at the Beijing Foreign Languages Institute and the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing from 1979 to 81. She has a Master of Arts in Chinese Language and Art History from the University of Melbourne and a PhD in Chinese Art History from the Australian National University. Claire was a curatorial advisor to the Asia Pacific Triennial in 1993, 96 and 99. She played an active role in the formation of the Asian Art Society of Australia and is currently a member of the Australia China Council. Her recent curatorial projects, very recent projects, include the exhibition The Great Wall of China at the Powerhouse, which is still on, and other histories, Guanwei's Fable for a Contemporary World. Please welcome Claire Roberts. Um, thank you very much, uh, Lynn. Um, it is a uh, great pleasure uh, to be back here um, again. Um, as Lynn said, um, you know, I've had a long involvement um, with the gallery through the Asia Pacific Triennial, and I know many of the people in the audience have also. Um, and so it gives me a um, particular sort of um, sense of pleasure and satisfaction to be at APT5 um, and also to see the remarkable development of the um, Gallery of Modern Art. It really is a fantastic achievement um, for Doug Hall, the director, and for all of the staff. And it really does represent you know, a sustained vision that we as, um, as uh, interested and um, partly you know, semi-involved people have observed over a very long period of time now. And I think you know, they really have stayed the course and created something really unique and very special um, for Queensland, but also for Australia and the world. Um, as uh, Lynn's introduction sort of suggested, I've sort of moved across between museums um, and, and galleries, um, and I hope that I might have something um, to add um, you know, today through, through the, my uh, recent experiences, um, some reflections that might be of use. Um, like Vilsoni and, um, and others, I also um, would begin by making the comment that art is extraordinary, that actually um, something, some kind of transformation has to occur, something magical, something um, that provides some kind of resonance, often may be hard to explain. A connection um, is formed, I guess, between uh, the viewer and the artwork. Now, it may be through uh, visual, sensory, intellectual, or emotional means. But nonetheless, the connection is very important. We live, however, in an environment you know, that today is increasingly influenced by popular culture, by television, by film, by lifestyle, by reality situations, and also in an environment where success is increasingly judged uh, by outcomes, by attendance figures, by sponsorship levels. Um, and so it's interesting, um, given that um, situation, to reflect on you know, how we um, engage with our audiences, maintain um, a popular interest, but without abandoning um, our key um, commitment to scholarship in its various forms. I guess, um, from my perspective anyway, I, I've seen quite an interesting cross-fertilization that's been happening between museums and, and art galleries over the last uh, dec decade or so, they've been very much influencing one another. And I think we can see this very clearly in the Queensland Art Gallery's uh, extended labels, the contextual information that they provide about artists, about artworks, um, their desire to introduce um, um, a program of activities and um, artworks that children would, would respond to. Um, they really have understood the need to connect with their public, the need for different kinds of interactivity. Um, a, and they haven't shied away from a recognition that information uh, being placed there can assist for some people in making that connection between the viewer and the artwork. I guess coming from um, you know, the Powerhouse Museum, um, the Museum of Thingamabobs, the Museum of the Everyday, um, we are in the most egalitarian and most democratic of all spaces in a reconstituted um, power station. 
I guess the powerhouse has prided itself on its access accessibility and its ability to connect with audiences. And I think we were one of the first institutions to introduce the idea of front-end evaluation or market research and applying those principles. Um, I was very skeptical at the beginning and I still remain a skeptic. Um, I figure that there needs to be a lot of um, consideration given to the various views of the stakeholders that of course is very important, but the institution itself has to have a vision and needs to boldly follow that vision and I think that's something that we have seen um, in the development of Queensland Art Gallery and of the Gallery of Modern Art. Oh. I guess I just wanted to um, quickly um, uh, talk about the two uh, recent projects that I've been involved with that Lynn's uh, mentioned, two powerhouse projects, uh, Great Wall and also Guanway, um, and perhaps um, reflect on some issues, some ways of thinking that um, I think have, have similarities or connections in, in relation to contemporary art. Uh, the Great Wall of China, which is still on, as, as Lynn said, at the Powerhouse Museum, is a large show. Um, you'd, many people would perhaps dismiss it, dismiss it, or those interested in contemporary art may dismiss it as a history exhibition. But I guess um, for, for us, um, it, it is an exhibition that has a historical dimension, but the whole exhibition is informed by a, a very important and underlying contemporary perspective. We really do chart the transformation of the Great Wall of China from its origins as a military structure and look at it uh, today as one of China's most important heritage icons and one of its most visited tourist destinations. We've really started from the vantage point of, of tourism and heritage um, where, where, where most people um, know it and we've taken our audiences back through history. Um, integrating, as we do, um, beautiful objects, artworks, decorative artworks, uh, large photographs, interactives, films, uh, multimedia, as a way to communicate these ideas. It's there for people to take or leave um, uh, and to provide some kind of context. I guess probably one of the most um, talked about and striking uh, elements of the exhibition is this 14 metre um, uh, series of panoramas um, that take visitors to the Great Wall. Um, it's a journey that we take people on. Um, it's with completely visual. There are um, no words. There is music. And I guess it's a way of bringing the landscape into the exhibition and using technology, emotion and a narrative journey to communicate with people. So I guess I, I would say with, with that exhibition that without a contemporary perspective, we have no way to connect with our audience. And certainly the exhibition has been incredibly successful and I think that is largely because of the efforts we've gone to to con, you know, reflect on the subject from a contemporary perspective. And this is the ex, uh, contemporary section of the exhibition where we look at the application of the um, Great Wall imagery in contemporary society, including as the badge on a policeman's uniform. Um, the other project that I wanted to mention very br br briefly is uh, Guan Wei. Um, the exhibition, his solo show, Other Histories, Guan Wei's Fable for a Contemporary World. Uh, that is still on at the museum. It's on for quite some time. Um, this for us was a very exciting project. Guan Wei, uh, most of you will know, um, very respected um, Chinese-Australian artist. Um, this exhibition is a fabulous counterpoint to the Great Wall um, and it has connections with the Great Wall. We, we begin in the Ming Dynasty and take people back um, in, or, or um, yeah, through to the, to the present. And of course we make use of the um, uh, the book by Gavin Menzies, 1421, which posits that China, in fact, discovered Australia. We have in our collection an object which um, has long been the subject of uh, scholarly and speculative inquiry that was discovered in Darwin, and many people have wanted to um, use that as evidence that, in fact, um, Zheng He, the Ming Dynasty admiral, um, discovered Australia some 600 years ago. So here we have an exhibition where Guan Wei and his team of artists painted a large series of murals, um, creating a fabulous tale um, 
that is informed by history, but certainly not based entirely on history. It's Guanwei's own tale of connection between China and Australia. Um, these are the team of artists. Uh, we invited the public into the gallery space to uh, um, observe them painting as the murals um, took shape. Um, this is in the beginning of the section. There's integration of objects from the museum's collection, which Guanwei selected together with me. Um, so it, it is a very um, playful um, exhibition where Guanwei reassigns meaning um, to objects from the museum's um, collection and he employs them in his fantastic narrative. Doug Hall has mentioned um, at the opening of Guanwei's exhibition where he acquired so boldly Echo for the gallery's collection that Guanwei is um, painting, history painting for the, 21st uh, for the 21st century and certainly the series of murals that form part of this Other Histories exhibition are very much in that genre. Artists can very elegantly and concisely deal with history and cross-cultural um, issues and I think um, cause us to reflect um, on what might have been. I guess art, um, what Guanwei um, and Ai Weiwei um, and other artists who are re represented in the Asia Pacific um, Triennial um, demonstrate to us that art um, can be both fun, humorous, whimsical, moving, but it also is often based on a serious reflection on their own position within society, their own position within their own culture, their own position within the international community, that it can be fun and serious at the same time. Thank you. Last but not least, Ai Weiwei, who um, I'm sure you'll all have seen already his outstanding contribution to APT5 um, with his work which has uh, taken over uh, the Watermall in the Queensland Art Gallery. Weiwei studied at the Beijing Film Academy between 1978 and 81 and during that time became one of the founding members of an avant avant-garde group in China which championed freedom of thought and expression. He moved to New York in 1981 where he immersed himself in modern and contemporary art and was quickly defined as a neo-Dadaist because he critically addressed traditions and conventions of art and cultural stereotypes in a similar way to Marcel Duchamp's provocative works which scandalised the art, art world in the first decades of the 20th century. Ai Weiwei's works respond to China's rich artistic heritage by reconfiguring objects such as you will have seen in our display here, Ming and Qing dynasty furniture and porcelain, Han dynasty urns and Neolithic vases. He returned to Beijing in 1993 where he's established a distinguished practice as an artist, curator, publisher and architect. Please welcome Ai Weiwei. Hello. <clears throat> uh, often I, when, whenever I come up to a stage like this, my mind is just blank. I don't know what to say. Uh, especially why after I listen to all, the, all those uh, respect um, professionals, make me even feel uh, difficult to add anything. So I may just talk something about uh, my experience in China, so which uh, um, uh, contemporary art in China till recent years, until like two years ago, still very much an underground uh, movement. And uh, we are about the first ones to make the publications and the uh, gallery space and uh, you know, uh, curating shows, which, but all under kind of fashion to like, uh, somehow like underground works. 
um, it often facing kind of problems can be shut uh, shut down right before the opening, and also can be uh, also can artists can be put in prison because some so-called wrongdoings. Uh, but that history has been lost for past 50 years or even longer. Uh, till recent years, the, the art started to become a part part of a, uh, state uh, propaganda um, name card, so uh, to show the West where become same kind of society with in using same kind of vocabularies. However, there's very few museums and uh, culture space which really uh, have true meaning of functioning in uh, in terms of involves the art into political social dialogue or to be part of social change. Um, even the museums, um, many cities have this kind of tendency to have uh, try news and buy news in China, but still it's really uh, under quite strong political censorship. And uh, it's not uh, uh, a true a truly practice uh, of uh, the art, the function of art. Uh, and uh, I think it's very totally against the spiritual uh, part of the contemporary movement. Um, so, of course, it's very obvious, uh, you know, the, the political and social change uh, uh, are very important, yeah, especially in the society like China and uh, the artists have the responsibility or curators or uh, critics uh, to be part of it. So uh, we are re really talking about very different manners uh, in this society and uh, in China. But however, um, the meaning of the, the institution, the vision, the, the concept are uh, always important, even I, th I think in, in here. Uh, often I don't like to p uh, participate in the event like this because uh, I often feel very uh, uncomfortable. It's very much like to lead a soldier to a war museum or something, you know, it's very different. The very uh, civilized, cultured, uh, taste making, uh, positions make uh, uh, artists somehow feel uneasy. Uh, also, it's a danger to to let artists to often to become associated with museums and galleries. I think which uh, can can somehow change the meaning of the art. Uh, this is from my personal point of view. Uh, so. It do often change the reason because through the so-called uh, uh, communication and uh, uh, and uh, to 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 give some kind of explanation, uh, often of course I appreciate you know other people to do it. You know I I, I really very admire of uh, what this uh, event or try news by news did. Uh, and I admire their their great uh, vision and the patient and all the details, but often for artists it's quite difficult uh, for me. And anyhow, uh, I think maybe we should have a kind of policy forbidden artists to go to museums or galleries, uh, which uh, maybe is necessary. It's not as a joke, but it's important. Uh, so that's. Uh, well, I can. I think I should uh, save some time. And thank you very much. Any questions, comments, responses? This one there.
I don't hear? understand. I don't, no? I, I don't understand. Sorry. Can we repeat the question with the mic, please? Uh, uh, it's nerve wracking to have your voice <laughs> from all walls. Um, I just wanted to ask um, whether he could uh, expand a little on the suggestion that um, artists should preferably be banned from, banned from uh, galleries and uh, museums. Uh, I think uh, artists, that, or uh, a, a, a man called himself an artist, uh, is very uh, different kind of species. I think uh, they are. Uh, they must have some kind of problem in express yourself uh, themselves through verbal or or normal communication. So they have to work on stones or, or work on flat paper, you know, they're really, you know, uh, somehow, you know, it's very difficult to, to be judged with our normal uh, standard behaviors. So it's quite embar embarrassing for me to sit in here, you know, to be, to be a look at it and to throw this microphone to answer your question. And even I, you know, I, I always have great uh, patience and uh, you know, try to behave like a, a civilized person. Mm -hmm. uh, such a big. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, you know, it's it's uh, it, you know, it's always uh, uh, we're con continuous uh, producing. And uh, uh, give you an example of myself. Till two two years ago, uh, there's almost no my work has uh, has been uh, ever been uh, presented in any galleries and museums I never had my own show in China and uh, but uh, now I had uh, 10 or even more museum eng engagement and uh, if I go to all those uh, openings and uh, you know my life will be totally ruined. <laughs> And uh, because I want to show my perfect uh, uh, human sides, so maybe that can answer your question. Okay, anybody else? Yes, up here. Yes, I wanted to ask a question that opened up the issue of the ordinary, which is an extraordinary one for a, a day like today, really, when you're looking at the, the birth of a, a major new cultural institution in Australia. And it's an interesting question to think about why the ordinary would be taken as a, a, a theme to christen the discussions around this. And I can see that in terms of the way institutions in Australia function at the moment, there is certainly a great demand to have audience uh, involvement and to be seen as quite popular and to relate to ordinary people, not to be really dealing exclusively with, with elites, with cultural elites, and certainly that would be a case. And clearly in terms of art history, there's a, a great deal of interest in the ordinary from Art Povera to, to the sorts of films coming out of people like uh, Lars von Trier and so on. Uh, but there's often a, a, a contradiction that emerges uh, where in terms of popular audiences uh, when looking at the sorts of blockbusters for instance that uh, are used to attract a mass audience that there seems to be a and please correct me if I'm wrong but there seems to be an interest in a mass audience in the the extraordinary which is the exotic something which comes from afar which seems very different from everyday experience uh, which is to do with celebrities, uh, with stars from Hollywood, with fashion from Paris. Uh, and uh, in terms of the way in which uh, institutions in Australia, and I guess overseas as well, function, I'm uh, interested to know in terms of um, the way in which the ordinary is presented, whether there is a sense that that is uh, how that might resonate in terms of uh, a larger audience, where the, where the audience for the ordinary might be. Are you directing your question at the panel generally or at somebody specifically? <laughs> um, I'll respond to the second half of the question, not the first, because I, um, 
I, I didn't convene the symposium. I was preoccupied with the building that we're in at the moment. Um, I, I, I guess I guess I'd just simply say in relation to, to blockbusters um, and anticipating you know audience responses, is that um, I don't think we can presuppose that there's a, a singular level of understanding that we pitch that cultural experience at. Um, I think there is a propensity um, in terms of um, producing exhibitions that they have to be of the highest scholarly standard to be able to secure the kind of loans and to engage the kind of people that are interested in what we do. Um, the challenge, of course, then in, in interpretation is to bring sometimes very high levels of, of scholarship around the syntax of subjects that may not interest our general audience uh, into an area which uh, makes that experience interesting and makes it, makes it relevant. Um, I don't know that... Um, I mean, I see Ron, Ron's here with the Egyptian show. I mean, he's presenting an exhibition of Egyptian antiquities to um, the last time there was a really major exhibition here. It was a generation ago. I mean, so reintroducing the work of a, a really exciting civilization to audiences under 20 years of age. I mean, it'd be interesting to know um, the nature of that experience, interpreting, and whether, in fact, audiences under 20 years of age, uh, how familiar they are with the subject and the extent to which they're actually astonished by it. Um, but I think given the, uh, as I said, I, I suppose coming back to the, to the, to the gallery of modern art, uh, one is uh, we, we, uh, we can't presuppose too much because we're actually living um, a very direct and a very immediate relationship with the object and with the artist and the audience. Um, and it's probably, I guess, thinking back to 93 that we can actually form a fairly clear view in increments of the way that uh, the art was presented, the, re the response that's made, and, 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 and I guess hone and, and, and refine the way in which we interpret it for a, a broader public while not diminishing the, uh, the, value of, uh, the value of the object or the relevance of the artist. I don't think that answers the question, but... Could I, could it does. Could I, could I just add um, something to that? Uh, I was just wondering whether one um, of the things that could perhaps um, bring the, uh, the, the level of the experience to the ordinary is to actually bring the artist to, to be there, to be present in the gallery. So in some ways I'm kind of suggesting that, that um, I Weiwei Wei doesn't keep away from going to the gallery, but he actually goes there, and that we meet him and we experience him as a real human being. The thing about those celebrities... Thank you, Thank you for that. <laughs> ..is that quite often those who are enamored by them, fascinated by them, are the ones who have never really experienced them in real life. Because when you do, you realize that celebrities are just as ordinary as anybody else and that humanizes the art and brings the art down to the ordinary, to the level, because that art was created by an ordinary human being. So I suppose I'm making a case for displaying not just the art, but to actually have the people who created the art there. And I think it's wonderful that we do have Ai Weiwei over here, and that we do have artists, real people. One of the things that I find very frustrating is when I go to exhibitions of Pacific art, quite often art that was taken away by missionaries and you know to overseas museums and they come back to the Pacific and we are portrayed as almost uh, as fossils, as though our culture is dead, as though the people are dead. Bring the people into this space, have them interact with audiences and that to me makes the whole experience ordinary. I have a question, but I just wanted to comment on that. According to that, it means you could never have spaghetti alla bolognese unless you go to Bologna. So I think you know we have to think of museums perhaps as palimpsests and not cordon sanitaire. Um, today, as most people know, it's AIDS Day. And I remember a young fellow, a student of mine at one point, talked about the fact that all the only sex he knew, and I'm getting to an art point, but um, he knew was safe sex, and that he and his generation had eroticized safe sex. And when people of my age and others uh, would talk about it, we'd say, oh, that can't be the same. There's this plastic in between you. And I began to think about that when I was listening to the panel, because I wonder how much of our museum experience has been plasticized. I mean, 
I have done in museum exhibitions just what Miss Roberts did, and we all say it's marvelous, but just because we put up a huge photographic panorama, that doesn't mean it gives you the feeling of walking on the wall. I was thinking they should have covered the whole floor in ashlar blocks and made it on a 45 degree <laughs> angle. Now we have to worry about people having heart attacks and all the lawyers come in, but that at least would have been a really good sense of what it's like to be on the wall, not a Kodak film or done on a maxi screen, etc. And I wonder if sometimes in the role of museums we're so concerned, as we must be, as being preservers of objects that are very fragile, that we do take them out of the realm in which they were originally born. And I'll just, I'll give you one example which maybe you'll comment on. At the Metropolitan Museum of Art, about six months ago, they did an exhibition of 18th century French fashion. And as most people know, fashion exhibitions tend to be the most troglodyte of all anywhere in the world. The, the comments, the garments don't move, they're full of tissue paper, the mannequins don't have any heads most of the time. And there, Philippe de Montebello, who is often thought to be a very um, crusty old museum director, said to the curator, well, make those dresses come alive. So what they did was did the exhibition in the Reitzman rooms, these extraordinary rooms taken from an 18th century French chateau, and they literally called the exhibition seduction. And you literally saw people engaged in sex on top of these 18th century tables, the hoop skirts pushed up, breeches down, and you did, there wasn't much that you had to imagine. A vase knocked over in the middle of this. Now, it was Grand Guignol. But it made you at least experience those things in the way in which they were worn. And you saw people did what we do nowadays without plastic, or maybe goatskin then, but were, how these things were used and not just through this academic plasticized view. And I wonder if people would want to comment on that because I think so many museums, not about the sex, although you're, you can, <laughs> but does one have museums anywhere in the world where we can have that proximity of the real, where I Weiwei would feel more comfortable, or where people would rush up and have a sock stuck in their mouth, as the gentleman from the Pacific Island mentioned. I have never been you to some poses. <laughs> I don't know, it's a matter of taking on. I, I think we should all feel flattered that during the course of this debate, he immediately looked at us and thought of condoms. So. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, so and we, plastic. Right. <laughs> so thank you. The um, oh, where, 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 where to begin? I mean, it's it's the uh, it's it's the it's the issue that I flagged before in, in my um, um, in, in some of the points I made in my address, which is um, the supposed neutrality of the object, which of course can never be neutral if it seeks to be something else and shouldn't be treated as such. The way in which you you seek to to animate them. Um, and I, I think that's one of the uh, one of the complexities. The other is dealing with contemporary art and the relation and the relationship institutions have with the artists is that of course they do seek to now make museum work. They make public work uh, as distinct from us finding work in the studio or through the dealer uh, and then it coming into sp public space. So it's a it's a con it's a it's a uh, can be a complicated relationship with the artist. But again, I'd say. It's, it's nothing new. I mean, I, I mentioned you know, the, my, one of my favourite books of Michael Fried's Absorption and Theatricality. He spends some time talking about grand political revolutionary painting as well. I mean, very much um, animated to, to engage the beholder in different ways and in unique, unique public spaces. Um, and that's, a, that's an ongoing kind of, uh, um, I guess, transfer of artist to image to public, uh, public space and then public reaction to it. And I, I don't know that I can offer a, a fixed and static view which, um, which is able to capture something which is in a you know, perpetual state of movement. Others, others might. Claire? Yeah, look, I'd, I'd um, I suppose, like to say, um, you know, doing an exhibition about the Great Wall, you know, is almost an impossibility. You know, you, you, it's like doing a show about the moon. But, um, you know, it's a cultural history and it's a contemporary history and we... Uh, attempted to actually um, offer different kinds of uh, perspectives and, and ways to um, be, you know, get closer for the audience members to get closer to the experience of the wall, whether it's military or you know, how it was built or how it was used. I guess uh, one of the other elements that we used is there's a, a blog site we've got you know, called Walking the Wall. There are um, a young Australian and a young American couple are walking the length of the wall and they're posting daily 
um, their daily journal in, in photographs and in text. And it's really the most sort of alive and, and riveting personal experience um, that you know we could find um, to actually uh, bring that experience sort of into into you know the museum context. And I think um, you know through technology you can do those kinds of things. And I guess um, you know in the limited time we've got, had to present, you know, uh, I mean perhaps. Um, um, you know, it wasn't possible to convey that, but I think, you know, we have, you know, like the Queensland Art Gallery, um, you know, attempted to use, you know, various means that are available to us to try and you know, make that connection. Um, if I could just add to what uh, Carol? Claire. Claire, Claire has just uh, mentioned. Uh, to me, uh, one of the wonderful things about uh, going to an exhibition, say, of, you know, the Great Wall or whatever it might be, or seeing it through film, is that it adds to your experience of the real thing. It extends it, it expands it. Otherwise, my, one might as well go to, uh, to the Great Wall of China and climb it. <laughs> but when you actually shoot it from angles in which you could never be if you were just walking it, because you'd be confined to that narrow space, if in a film you could juxtapose it with other kinds of walls in modern day life, and websites and new kinds of technologies and different things you can do, you can see the Great Wall in a way you have never seen before. So it is a representation that expands the real thing in terms of our understanding of it. And this is why I think the kind of work we do is really educational as well as entertaining. Well, Thomas is going to Sydney tomorrow morning, so I'm sure his first stop will be the powerhouse. <laughs> But Tom, Tom also did the ex Tom is director of the Warhol Museum, did the exhibition um, in which he invited John Walters to do a show called um, Andy, War Andy curated the show on Andy Warhol's porn. And it's the only museum anywhere, I was going to say, in America in the world that actually had the celebrated uh, American glory hole as part of the, uh, part of the installation. It's true, isn't it? <laughs> With condoms. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but no. Can I just perhaps add a little um, footnote to, to this part of the discussion, which is that um, it seems to, I mean, certainly I suppose when the discussion becomes about museums and institutions, it does somehow seem to settle down to the object in, in the final instance, whereas, um, for instance, what, what, what I'm involved in is we, we don't work with a collection. We don't necessarily work with works of art. Um, we have to just work with... Um, I suppose, animating ideas. And I think that's very interesting. I think methodologies can come in here. I mean, um, there are, perhaps there's ways of um, working through, uh, you know, the idea of the Great Wall of China. Um, some kind of exhibition itself becomes a kind of research methodology where not necessarily objects and spectacle images are, are presented. But, you know, I mean, I think there are all very, very different approaches to sort of um, conveying an object um, as an object or through kind of... Um, through an idea as well, and, and kind of, I think that's interesting. And it reminded me of um, a conversation I had in Tokyo the other day with someone who said, you know, why are there so many sort of uh, universities which have museums attached to them, but no museums which have ever developed a, a university in it? And, I th and, you know, it's a very kind of obvious point, but actually, I mean, as far as I know, there's no museum which actually has a kind of uh, a, cis a functioning kind of formalized university within the museum. Um, unless anyone knows of one. But um, I thought, you know, why is that? It's an interesting kind of question. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of scholarship goes on, obviously, but uh, it's quite kind of contained, I think. Thank you all for coming. See you tonight, all dressed up. Okay.